see, maybe it starts with an S. Rhymes with muffin, but not exactly. Samson, oh, no, thank you very much. That's excellent. Good, 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 good. gospel reading today
gives me an opportunity to say a special thanks to Katie Morrison and Sarah Berry. Thank you all both for your music. Um, there's something so beautiful about the soprano voice and also the cello. just uh, adds enormously to our worship. Thank you. Now, it's time for our gospel reading. It comes to us from uh, the 8th chapter of Mark. Jesus, as we know, has been going along and doing a number of great deeds, healings, and the kind. And so now he comes to a fundamental question, what does all this mean? And he asks it in a provocative way. He says, who do people say that I am? That's a question for all of us and for every age. Let us stand together for the reading of the gospel. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with holy angels. And this is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, along about 500 BCE, the Chinese philosopher Confucius warned that social disorder begins with the failure to call things by their proper names. Well, I sort of hope that that's not true because a lot of things get called funny names nowadays. For instance, subprime mortgage loans. Subprime loans are actually bad loans, aren't they? But let's not tell the investors. And risky subprime loans may result in what they call negative equity, which, if you're still with me, isn't equity at all, but is debt. The scripture we've read today warns us against lazy and inaccurate speech, that is, calling things by the wrong names. We tend to do this kind of double-talking about things that matter to us the most, because we assume we're right, I suppose, that the stakes are high for us about those things, and using euphemisms uh, for things that really matter just amplifies the problem. The reading from James reminds us that the tongue, though it is a small part of the body, is still a powerful, powerful instrument, and often the tongue is difficult to control, how great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, says James. And Jesus is also on about the precision of speech, especially 
precision when we are talking about faith. And so he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And it's kind of interesting, the disciples want to waffle just a little bit. They want to give answers that leave them some wiggle room. And so they say, some people say John the Baptist or maybe Elijah or possibly one of the other prophets. And so Jesus asked them then a a direct question, a question that requires the disciples to say what it is they really mean. No more fudging. It's time to be clear. But who do you say that I am? Jesus asks. The reformer John Calvin read these verses and made a distinction between speech that occurs inside the church and things that are said outside the church in the wide world. The whole world, he says, may be carried away by its own inventions. Among those inventions, says Calvin, are rumor and falsehood. But, says Calvin, believers adhere to Christ. The unsettled voices of the world are confused and discordant, Calvin says, but the voice of Christ calls us away from all that is unsettled and wavering, all those voices and their contending opinions. Who do you say that I am? asked Jesus. That's a question to be considered carefully. And if we're going to get the answer right, we'll need to separate ourselves from all that destructive, nattering talk out there that surrounds us in our culture and world. The damaging negativity of our politics, the hyperinflated dramatics of a TV newscast, hate speech that masquerades as free speech, public figures who have made that ugly word bloviate necessary and popular again. We're enduring more than just a loss of civility in our age, and it can't help but have its effect on us. The cultural critic H.L. Mencken described this kind of talk as a loud burble of words, reminiscent, he says, of stale bean soup of college yells, of dogs barking idiotically through endless nights. And the effect on us is that it makes us lazy and careless about our talk. We can't help but absorb some of this culture around us, and it makes us all tense and angry. And so we say harmful things about each other, though We might observe, mostly we say those things not face-to-face, but behind each other's backs. This kind of speech is, of course, not freeing. In fact, it puts limits on our ability to communicate with one another. Overly aggressive speech naturally results in defensive responses. There's no dialogue there. We're not talking with one another. We're talking at one another. And here's the hidden secret. Really? Really? Nobody's listening. Whoops. Well, I'm not a sociologist. Uh, I'm a Bible man. Uh, Speech, though, is also critical to the Bible. Have you ever thought, and it is true, that God speaks creation into existence. God speaks and chaos is retired in place of God's good creation. The Bible says, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And speech is also critical in that covenant at Sinai, the Ten Commandments. Remember, For instance, commandment number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness. False witness against whom? 
Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. And by neighbor is really meant all of us, uh, all of us who are members of a community, in this case a community of faith, all of us that God has brought together for good, not for evil. The covenant at Sinai doesn't really envision the Christian church, or does it? We are, after all, God's people, and we are, as the Hebrews were, on our way together, and the way is sometimes a wilderness. In Isaiah it says, Woe to you who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. Misstating things, misspeaking, making false witness, the calling of things by their wrong names, all of that has a bad consequence for the people of faith. I gave this sermon the title, Raising the Roof of Your Mouth, because I really do want us to raise the level of our conversations with one another. God's people have a real responsibility to leave what Calvin called the world's confused and discord voices out there where we found them, and instead, while we are together, learn to speak not ugliness, but speak of adherence to Christ. I can't help but say this is what our consultants from the Center for Healthy Churches were telling us also. We need not just more communication, but better communication. Communication that is more faithful, more helpful, more healing. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks. The answer is that Jesus is the Messiah. Peter answers that question correctly. But there's a lot more that comes out as this passage rolls on. The real answer to who am I, when Jesus asks it, is that following the Messiah, Savior, means denying ourselves and taking up our crosses. It isn't then business as usual for Christians. There is a strong element of sacrifice required of us, self-giving, offering ourselves as Christ offered himself. That's what it means to follow Christ. And sacrifice relates to our speaking because it reminds us that when we are talking, we cannot just be talking about us. It isn't all about us, as it's sometimes said. Think about it. Dialogue and discussion requires that we all admit the thoughts and concerns of the other person into the mix. Listening is really an act of sacrificing the self, if only for a moment. But listening and caring And hearing about what the other one has to say is so rich. It is such a rich experience. But it is so lacking in the world around us. It really requires, think about this, it requires a a reasonable level of of self-restraint to live among the membership of the community of the people of God. That's really all I'm talking about. Undisciplined speech can come out in the form of gossip, gossip which destroys the truth. Undisciplined speech can be someone's opinion and the expression of innuendo that confuses. That tiny tongue in our mouths is so mighty, says James. It can give voice to our false assumptions which become false witness. It can destroy the community, or it can, it can build us up. Who do you say that I am, asked Jesus. What is it really about following the Lord? 
He is not the Lord of harm. Jesus is not. He is the Lord of healing. He is not the giver of discouragement. He's the giver of life. He's not the speaker of of falsehoods, but he is instead himself the truth. It is a privilege to live for a self-defying and loving, perfectly loving Savior. It is an honor to discipline ourselves in memory of his sacrifice. It is healthy for us to hold on to what is true. It is a witness to the rest of the world that there is a community like this one. There is a community like the church. We render obedience to our Lord when we say such disciplined things as follows from our faith. When we are patient, when we say things that heal and help, things like, I hear you, I understand you, I would like to hear more, you are respected, you are loved, you are even forgiven, and we, we are together on this. You see, we have to call things what they really are. The church really is the community of Jesus Christ. And all people are welcome here as we all together try to raise the roof of our mouths. And thanks be to God this day. Amen. It was a great pleasure uh, earlier in this day to receive four new members into the life of our church and I'll just mention their names now. Do remember that we're having a membership uh, reception, new members reception following this service. Uh, Joanne Pearson, who gave our children's sermon today, is coming to us by reaffirmation of her Christian faith. Shirley Carrick, uh, from transfer from a sister church in this city. Uh, Linda Johnson, transferring from the Freedom uh, Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And Barbara Greider, also transferring from a sister church in this city. We welcome those four fine ladies into our church and ministry. Uh, Many of them have been involved in our church uh, for for many years, but uh, we are glad that they are uh, committing uh, in a special way this day. And while I'm mentioning this, uh, we also received two new members last week, but did that after worship, so I want to give thanks for Beth and Wayne Pope who have joined our church. Uh, Beth and Wayne, of course, so much a part of our church music program. Encourage you to get to know these folks as you have opportunity in the life and ministry of the church. Give thanks for them and with them all that we've been given to do. And now let us pray. Lord, we pause for a moment, again asking that you will uh, bless our speaking, that we might say things which are true and right and which are encouragement to others around us. Uh, Save us from the temptation of uh, speaking gossip or saying things which are wrong or entertaining dramatic notions. Instead, give us the simple, uncomplicated pleasure of knowing and loving as you know and love in your church. In these things we pray in Christ our Lord. Amen.
affirmation of faith is again drawn from a declaration of faith, and it is printed in our order of service. Together, let us say what we believe. God sends us to proclaim the gospel. We believe God sends us to tell all nations that Christ calls everyone to repentance, faith, and obedience. We are to proclaim by word and deed that Christ gave himself to set all people free from sin and self-hatred, from ignorance and disease, from all forms of oppression, and even from death. We are to offer them in Christ's name fullness of life now and forever. Amen. And please be seated. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for your stability in our lives. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are grateful this day for waking up for another morning, another beginning, another opportunity to be your people, to serve and honor you in word and deed. You ask us, who do you say that I am? And we say that you are the great creator, that nothing has been made that was not made by you. And then you sent your son into the world, entrusting him to human hands. And he grew into a man, and by his works he showed us how to live. He suffered for our sake, died on the cross. And we all come together to remember the great story that is your story and ours. You have called us out by name, and we belong to you. We are a living testimony that yours is a love that will never let us go. You have given us the gift of our lives, that even when we falter from our ways, you believe in us still. And we thank you for this amazing earth, for clean water and rich soils, abundant sunshine and all the foods that you have made for our health and enjoyment. Give all the people the gratitude to share, especially with those who do not have such riches and who are hungry today. We ask you today to be with our families who have experienced hardship or illness or death. Reach out and assure us that in the middle of all that can happen that you are still our God and you will carry us through. And someday when we reach the other side, we will raise our hands and say, Glory, glory to you, our Lord on high. And now keep us on your path where your light shines upon us all and where you value us, not by what we have done, but how generously we give of ourselves to the building of your kingdom. Let us all remember that we have not been put here to be served, but to serve others as we follow after Jesus. It is in his name that we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Presbyterian Disaster Assistance is our denomination's organization for enabling the whole church to address natural disasters and human upheaval. The refugee refugee crisis in Europe, the floods in South Asia, and hunger issues in Africa are situations where the financial and personal resources of Presbyterians can be brought to bear. We respond to the goodness of God by which we have been given everything when we give of ourselves. Let us come before God with our tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Again, O oh God, we are grateful people and glad to show our gratefulness, our gratitude. We do pray that you will bless this offering as it comes and as it goes to the work and ministry of the church. Uh, guide and direct our hearts as well, that we might give ourselves fully, indeed, that we might take up our cross and follow you. And these things we pray in Christ our Lord. journeys, but courage will come with the sound of your steps by our sides, and with all of the family that you save by your love, we'll sing to your dawn at the end of our journey, and the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you, each one, and abide with you forever.